in Luke chapter 15, although we're going to touch on a couple of other scriptures as well. One is going to be the 23rd Psalm. Most of you, some of you will have it memorized. you say, oh, I know all about that one. Good. Uh, maybe you want to turn to it. If you don't, we're just going to touch on that just a little bit. And then we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John chapter 10, and we're just going to pick up a few words out of that chapter before we get into Luke. So if you can find 23rd Psalm, John chapter 10, Luke 15, you're on the right path. As always, we encourage you to bring a Bible, open it up, read it. You need to get familiar with your Bible when you're comfortable. I had the joy yesterday as we were passing out New Testaments there at the uh, Rabbit Festival. I went to a booth where there was a young man sitting there, and I think he was doing those temporary tattoo things, you know, they kind of just glue on or paste on, whatever they do to him. And he was sitting there all by himself. He didn't have any customers at the time. And I asked him, I said, sir, would, would you like to have a little pocket New Testament? He said, boy, I sure would. That kind of surprises you sometimes. But he did. He said, I sure would. And I said, really, that's great. And he said, mine is worn out. And he reached down and he picked up his, and that looked like it had been through the war. He had a worn out, dirty old New Testament that he'd been carrying with him and all these carnivals where he'd been traveling around. He said, I was wondering where I was going to be able to find another one. And God brought him one yesterday. I wasn't God, but God sent one to him. So we always encourage you, get your Bible, have one. If you've got a pocket edition, carry it with you. Some of you say, well, i got mine in my phone. God bless you. If you do, use it. Use it. God's Word is absolutely perfect and it's precious. Don't let it slip away from you. You know, we're talking about revival. And revival is not something that happens when you got an out-of-town preacher come in and, you know, he takes out a sermon and preaches it and you say, call that revival. No, revival is something that God does. When he changes the hearts of people, he starts with his own people, people that have been born again and adopted into his family, Christian people, that somehow their zeal has cooled off a little bit. They've gotten away from the Lord just a little bit, and they need to come back to Him. They need to get the fires rekindled and revive. That's what reviving is. That's what revival is all about. And then from there, it goes out to bringing lost souls to Jesus. That's what God does, and only God can do it. Now, He uses us to pray for it. He uses us to bring people to the revival services where they can hear the Word of God and be touched by the Word of God. But we are praying and seeking revival, and it can start today. It doesn't have to wait until Paul's journey gets here. So I, I hope that when we prayed for revival, uh, revival earlier and Brother Russ led us in that prayer that you were saying, yes, Lord, start with me today. I need it. If you need it, this is the time to get it. I ask you to turn to the 23rd Psalm or at least be familiar with it where the psalmist, King David, who started off as a young shepherd boy, said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He gives me everything I need. He leads leading beside still waters, put, it puts me in green pastures. He restored my soul. When the Lord is your shepherd, he takes care of all your needs. The psalmist knew it back then. Jesus talked about being our shepherd in the 10th chapter of John. He says he's the good shepherd. There's a lot of shepherds. And if we consider ourselves to be sheep, we've got to be careful which shepherd we follow whose flock we're in. But when the Lord Jesus is your shepherd, listen, you cannot improve on that because when you look in the 10th chapter of John, he says the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep and that's exactly what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. He laid down his life so we could live, protecting us from the hell that we deserve. He not only said the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, in that same chapter, he said my sheep Hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. That's how you can tell you're his sheep. He said, I give unto them eternal life. They'll never perish. If he's your shepherd, you can rejoice over that fact today. If he's not your shepherd, you need to turn to him. You need to come to him because nobody else can say what he said. Nobody else can do what he does. Nobody else can give you eternal life and guarantee you you will never perish. You'll never die and go to hell. Nobody else can do that except Jesus. Now that we've talked about that, he said, well, why in the world wouldn't anybody say, no, I don't think I want any part of him? 
I mean, if they understand what Jesus is willing to do for them in spite of who they are and where they start from, why in the world would anybody tell him no? I don't understand that. But there's another question. And the question that we're really wanting to get into today because we're talking about revival and Christians that have cooled off and wandered off and need to come back. Why in the world would a Christian, having received all this from the Lord Jesus, start wandering away and not want to be as close to him as they could possibly be? We're going to look at that this morning. Luke chapter 15, if you would please. Verse 3. I love it because it follows verse 2 where they were claiming that he was receiving sinners and in eating with them. Well, he sure did, and I'm glad he still does. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friend and his neighbor, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Wow. Can you imagine a shepherd with some sheep? He's got a hundred of them. That's a pretty good size flock, one man to keep up with. And by the way, in that part of the world, they don't take care of their sheep like they do here. Here in our part of the world, they use dogs, sheep dogs, to herd the sheep up. Over there, they don't. They just teach the sheep to follow the shepherd. From the time the sheep is born, they bond with that shepherd and he'll give a special cry for his flock and they will follow him wherever he goes and makes that cry. And they know that they can trust him. He does. He lets them lie down by still waters. He leads them to green grass. He protects them. And if you can imagine a shepherd there has a hundred sheep and then one of them wanders off. I mean, that sheep's been well cared for just like the rest of the flock. I mean, he'd been through water. He's been in the green grass. He'd been protected like all the rest of them. That shepherd had taken care of that sheep's needs ever since that little sheep was born. Why in the world would he wander off? Why would a sheep wander off? Knowing all of that, there's got to be some reason. There's got to be an answer to the question. The answer is real simple. Sheep aren't very bright. I mean, they're really not. Somebody said sheep are stupid. Eh, they're foolish. They do dumb things. But with no logic to them, the brain doesn't work too well. You give you a picture of this sheep. He's, he's out there on the hillside, and he's with his flock, and, man, he's got green grass right in front of him. Now, when a sheep has green grass right in front of him, you know what that sheep does. He puts his head down and he focuses on that green grass and he just starts eating. And he just keeps eating and eating and eating until the grass goes. And, and out of the corner of his eye, he might be watching the other sheep to make sure he's still in the middle of the flock or he may get so focused on that green grass that he doesn't notice the other sheep aren't there. He doesn't notice the shepherd's not there. I mean, he is totally focused on filling his belly with the green grass. Until one day, he looks around and says, where'd they go? Where'd they go? I know some Christians like that. <laughs> I do. I mean, we get so involved with our material needs and our physical desires and just kind of wandered off, paying no attention to where we're going. And when you translate that into Christians with the Lord being our shepherd, why in the world would we stray? Do we get so focused on filling our bellies and grazing, if you will, that we're not paying attention to where we're going? I think the answer is yes. We get distracted real easily from our shepherd because there's so much green grass in front of us and it just looks so good. Now, if the shepherd didn't care for every one of his sheep, he learned that he, at the end of the day he's counting them. Have I got all my sheep? I'm well, there's not, I was supposed to have 100. I didn't sleep at 99. You'll count them again. Nope, there's 99 sheep. Now, if, if he didn't really care for every one of those sheep, you'd say, eh, hey, there's only one gone. I got 99 more. I just, what's the big deal? Uh, he may come back on his own, or maybe he'll survive on his own without me. I'm just going to sit down here the rest of the 99, and I think I'll rest. I'll just let him go. Oh, well, that's not how shepherds think, not good shepherds. No, no, 
that one sheep is as important to them as all the other 99. He loves that sheep just as much as he does the others. And he said, nope, I'm going to go find that sheep. It says here that he would leave the others in the wilderness. Actually, he would put them into a sheepfold somehow where they could be protected and, and maybe a pile of rocks around it, maybe some logs or something, and put them in a corner to where they would be somewhat safe, and then he would go look for that other sheep. Now, it doesn't tell us how long he was searching for the other sheep or how long he was leaving the rest of the flock, but he did leave them to go find that other sheep. That's what it says there. He would go after the one which is lost. He'll search and he'll search and he'll search. Something else we know about sheep. If you've ever been around them much, I know I have not, but I've been around them a little bit. If they're grazing, they're pretty quiet. They don't make much noise at all. But when that sheep finally picks his head up out of the green grass and starts looking around and says, there's no more sheep around me. I'm all by myself. Where's the shepherd that's supposed to protect me? There's about to be a wolf behind that rock. That, that's loosely translated for bleat, okay? Bleat, that's what the noise that a sheep makes. I had to look it up in the dictionary and make sure I had the right word. To, a sheep bleats. That noise that you just heard or something similar. He starts making that noise. He's scared. He, what, you know what he's doing? He's saying, Shepherd, hey, I'm over here. Come get me. Protect me. I need some help. He starts bleeding. And the shepherd listens for that cry. He wants to hear where that sheep is. If he can't see him, he knows that sooner or later that sheep's bound to make a noise. The problem is that when the sheep is making that bleeding noise, the wolf can hear it too. The shepherd's got to get to him quicker than the wolf does. So the sheep needs to bleat as quick as he can, as close as he can, and not get too terribly far away from the shepherd because there's wolves out there. What happens when we're talking about Christians? Does that fit us? Yeah. Oh, absolutely it fits us. You know it does. I mean, when we get to wandering off from the Lord, we've got to be careful that we don't get too terribly far away because the wolf might hear us bleeding before the shepherd can come to us and rescue us. Before we get rescued, not that, the Jesus, that Jesus doesn't hear us, he does, but sometimes that wolf is ready to pounce on us. Some of you can say, you know what, I've been there. I was close to the Lord at one time and then I wandered off and I went in my own way and I wound up there's all kinds of wolves out there that attack me. I mean, I, I, I got attacked. I got caught up in all kinds of things. Maybe that's where you are today. I don't know. But if so, I pray you're listening. If the Lord is your shepherd and you're part of his flock, you can take courage in the fact that he loves you. Whether you're close to him with all of the other sheep or whether you have strayed away, he still loves you as much as he loves the other 99. He does. He may not be happy with you. He wishes you hadn't done that, but he loves you. And so I want to encourage you, the fact that he does love you, get as close to him as you possibly can. Wouldn't you rather be close to somebody that loves you than somebody that wants to kill you? Sure. Stay close to him. And as long as you're close to him, you'll be protected and you'll be provided for because that's what shepherds do and that's what the great good shepherd Jesus does. If you have wandered off, I plead with you, pick up your head. Quit focusing on the physical, the material, that which has led you away from the Lord. Quit focusing on that and look for the shepherd. Look for the shepherd. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look ahead of you. Look behind you. Try to find your shepherd. Find the Lord Jesus and say, I want to come to you as quickly as I possibly can. And if you cannot see Jesus with your head lifted, realizing you've strayed, start bleating. Start crying out, Jesus, I'm over here. Come get me. I don't know how to find my way back. I, I'm so tangled up over here. I don't know how to find my way back. Come get me. Rescue me. If that's you, I want to let you know something. Jesus knows exactly where you are right now. He knows. 
He knows what's going on in your life. He knows how far away you are and he knows what's going to take to bring you back. And if you'll listen carefully, you'll hear him calling you by name saying, come back to me. Come back to me. I'll still protect you. I'll still provide for you. I'll still love you. Just come back to me. Come on back. Verse 5 said, when he hath found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. That's an interesting thing. You see, when he finds the sheep, sometimes the sheep could not come back. He'd call the sheep, the sheep would bleat, he'd call the sheep and the sheep his whole life. When he heard the shepherd call, boy, that's where he'd go. He'd been trained his whole life, every day. If the shepherd moved with the flock, he gave out a special cry that only that shepherd gave to his flock, the sheep would follow him. If another shepherd came with his flock and he gave his cry, this shepherd's flock wouldn't follow him. So that when that sheep who has strayed hears his shepherd calling, he's going to go to him if he can. If he can. But sometimes he can't. Sometimes that sheep might get wedged in between some rocks where he just can't move. Maybe he's tangled up in the briars. That old wool's all tangled up in the briars and he's struggling and trying to get out because he's wanting to get back to the shepherd. He's wanting, he can hear him calling. He knows where he needs to go, but he can't get there. That's when the shepherd rescues the sheep. Oh, listen, sin does that to Christian people that wander away from the Lord. Briars tangle us up. Rocks wedge us in to where we want to get back to Jesus. We know where he is. We can hear him calling our name, but we can't seem to get there. The good news is the great shepherd, the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus will come right to where you are and he will pick you up out of those briars. He'll unwedge those rocks and he'll say, come on. And notice what he does with him. He doesn't say, all right, you starry, stupid old sheep, bang, 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 get back with the flock. He doesn't do that, does he? He puts him on his shoulders and he carries him back to where he should have been. I'm glad he does that. If not, he'd have beat me to death before I got back to the flock a few times. Maybe you too. Oh, no. He carries him back on his shoulders. Maybe the sheep is totally exhausted from trying to get back to Jesus on his own and just couldn't do it. Jesus can do it. Jesus can bring you back. Yes, he can. Maybe you said, oh, I've tried. I can't live that Christian life. I even tried going to church and I, I can't make it. I tried reading my Bible. I don't do that. I'll keep failing everything I do to try to come back to Jesus. He'll come get you. If you bleat long enough and say, Jesus, come get me and really want him to, he'll come get you. You're his sheep. He loves you. You're important to him. But this shepherd put that pitiful animal on his shoulders and carried him back. And I want you to notice the last word in verse 5. What is that shepherd doing as he's going back to the flock? He's not fussing at that sheep, is he? My Bible says he's rejoicing. You got a happy shepherd on your hands with a sheep on his shoulders. I went and got that last one. I got that one that wandered off. Uh, come on, sheep, we're going back to the flock where you should have been all along. He is rejoicing. Got a happy shepherd. No doubt that shepherd had to do it more than once. I mean, a shepherd with a hundred sheep. A wandering off sheep is pretty common. They have a habit of doing that. So he's probably day after day going to chase him down another wandering sheep and picked him up out of the briars and out of the rocks, put him on his shoulders and carried him back home. And you know what? The next day, that sheep's back in the flock. That shepherd's looking around counting again. Up, oh, down to 99 again. I wonder which one wandered off this time. Same one or another one. It doesn't really matter because the shepherd's going to go get that sheep and I'll say, that's that same stupid sheep. Now, I don't know. I, I've never talked with a shepherd about having a hundred sheep. If he could tell the difference in every one of them, if he had a name on all of them or numbers or something, so he could say, oh, it was number 38, the one that wandered off. I, he did it again. I'm going to get him. I don't know. I think a lot of times he couldn't tell one sheep from another except they were his. Now, I do know over in Israel, where I, which I've seen, they, they, they mark their sheep so they can tell theirs from the sheep that belong for, to some other shepherd. They use spray paint. 
They do. Psst. Purple is my color. Psst. Psst. All my sheep got purple dots on them. That's how they could tell it. But if you've got 100 sheep that have purple dots on them, which one is number 36? Don't know. But I'll tell you this, it doesn't really matter, my friend. Listen, it doesn't really matter how many times you have wandered off. Your shepherd will come get you. He won't say you've gone too many times. No, sir, Jesus loves you. You can't stop him from loving you. You can't stop him from coming after you if you'll just bleat. And just say, Jesus, I need you. Come on, Jesus, come bring me back home. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Oh, and when he carries you back, he is going to be rejoicing. Verse 6 says that when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. <laughs> oh, listen. Not only is the shepherd happy, he wants everybody else to be happy too. You can translate this into the shepherd and going back to the other sheep saying, come on sheep, you rejoice with me, but sheep don't rejoice too much. But you can put it into the Christian realm and you can say, well, listen, when there is a Christian who has wandered off from the Lord Jesus and he comes back to the Lord Jesus, I want to let you know something. Your shepherd, your savior, your king, your Lord is rejoicing and he's going to get the other Christians around you to rejoice too. In other words, I'm telling you this, friend, if you're one of those that have wandered off and the Lord Jesus is calling you back today and you come down here and you get right with the Lord today, and you say, listen, I want to rededicate my life to Christ today. I have not been living for the Lord Jesus like I should have, but I want to today. This bunch of sheep, this bunch of neighbors, this bunch of Christians, you know what we're going to do? We're going to rejoice. Yes. We're going to rejoice together. Why? Because our shepherd is rejoicing. It's important. Yes. So don't worry about it. Don't say, well, I don't know. I'd like to go down there and to get my heart right with Jesus today. I, I, I need to do that, I know, but I, oh, goodness, what are they going to think about me? They're going to think hallelujah about you. That's what they're going to think about you. We're going to be rejoicing beyond belief that one of the Lord's sheep has come back home, that you're back where you belong. You're not out there in the wilderness. You're not in the briars. You're not in the rocks. You're close to your shepherd, your savior, your Lord. And we're going to rejoice together. Also, I cannot encourage you too much to cry out to Jesus and let him bring you on back home again. Don't let your pride keep you from doing that. Just come get in on the rejoicing. Just come get in on it. Cause it. Make it happen. But the celebration, if you were to do that today, a celebration will take place here in just a matter of minutes. If you were to do that today and the celebration began and people were saying, oh, praise God, thank you. We were rejoicing a while ago about our brother's testimony about his mother accepting Christ. Hallelujah. This would be the same type of thing. But I want to let you know something. The rejoicing won't stop here. you got to read verse 7. Yeah. Oh, it gets bigger and better. Look. Verse 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than over the 99, <laughs> which need no repentance. You're going to start a party in heaven, friend, when you come home. You say one sinner. Well, you're talking about lost sinners getting saved? Yep. You're talking about Christian sinners getting back right with the Lord? Yep. Sinners, we're all sinners. It's sin that takes us away from our Savior, is it not, once we've been saved? Well, when we repent, that means we quit going in that direction. We turn around and we come back to Him. What's happening in heaven? Joy. Oh, the angels are shouting, look at there. Oh, He came back. Jesus brought Him back. Hallelujah. Look, He's got Him on His shoulders. He's bringing Him back. He wanted to come back. He was bleeding. And Jesus heard Him. He's brought Him back. Hallelujah. They're celebrating in heaven. They're celebrating in Christian communities and in church. The Savior's celebrating. He's rejoicing. You can cause that today if you'll just come back to the Lord Jesus. I know some people read this and they look at the word lost in verse 4 and they say, well, he's talking about that sheep that was lost. And in verse 6 again, I'm sorry, the tail end of verse 6, he says, my sheep which was lost. They said, oh, does that mean that that was part of his sheep and part of his flock and he got lost? He lost his salvation? No, it doesn't. That just means that sheep picked his head up one day and looked around and said, I don't know where I am. 
That's what lost means. Here's not talking about his spiritual salvation. He's talking about, how'd I get here? I don't know about you. I've had times in my life like that. How did I get here? Lord, I used to be close to you. I used to enjoy fellowshipping with you. I used to enjoy reading your word. I used to enjoy praising you in church and being around other Christians and doing that stuff that they all do. And today I look at it and I say, where'd he go? What happened? Woke up lost. Didn't lose my salvation. It was my location that was in question. How did I get this far away from Jesus? Maybe you can identify with that, but I'm going to tell you something. If, if, if you can see yourself as maybe as lost and Jesus finding you and bringing you back home as one of his own, not losing your salvation at all, but just losing your location, you're going to bring some joy. All of heaven's going to rejoice. Christians are going to rejoice. Jesus is going to rejoice. And you know what? You're going to rejoice too. You're going to get the greatest blessing of all. I just got one question for you. Are you willing to be that one sinner who repents and causes the rejoicing to start today? That's the question. Maybe Jesus is not your shepherd because you chose for him not to be your shepherd, but you can change that. You really can. You can change it today saying, you know what, I need a shepherd. I need a good shepherd. I need a shepherd who loves me so much he'll die for me. And Jesus did that. I, I need a shepherd who can give me eternal life and Jesus is promising me that. I need a shepherd that will say you will never, never perish and I don't want to perish because that means die and go to hell. Jesus can do that. For yeah, I think I want Jesus to be my shepherd. So I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm going to repent of living my life without Christ. And I'm going to trust him today. The very moment you do that, you decide that's what you're going to need to do, and then you do it. You actually you, you speak to the Lord and say, I've broken your commandments. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I repent of that sin. And Lord, I'm coming to you to be my shepherd, to be my savior, to be the Lord and master of my life. Please come into my heart and save me and take over as my shepherd. I'm just going to follow you like a sheep follows his shepherd. I'm going to trust you. If you've never done that, this is the day to do it. The day. Not tomorrow, today. Tomorrow's not promised. You have today. You have this moment. You have this hour. Now is the time. Or if you're one of those sheep that have wandered off, now is the time to come home. Will you repent? And let the rejoicing begin. I'd like to meet with you down here at the front and pray with you. If either of those circumstances fits you. Let's start a celebration in heaven. Heavenly Father, oh, I thank you for that wonderful parable that Jesus taught those many years ago. I thank you, Lord, that when I was just a boy, I understood a little bit and enough to trust Jesus as my Savior. I called out to Him in faith, just childlike faith. I said, Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Please, come into my heart and save me. Please. I believe you died on a cross to pay for my sins. You rose from the dead, you're alive. That's why I'm asking you. That's why I'm believing and trusting you. Oh, Father, if there's anybody that needs to pray a prayer like that and mean it right now, I pray that that's exactly what they're doing. And as they pray that prayer, realize that you're hearing that cry. And help the Lord to come forward and make it public that we might rejoice. And Father, for Christians that are not near as close to you as we ought to be, may we bleat. May we say, Jesus, here I am. Come bring me back close. And may we let it be known today we're rededicating our life to Christ to be identified with him as part of his flock because we're going to be real close to him. Oh, Father, bring the Christians home today. And may they let it be known publicly as well.
In Jesus' name, amen.